Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the Living with Disability Research Centre seminar for uh, September. I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement to country. La Trobe University acknowledges that our campuses are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise that their ongoing connection to the land and value their unique contribution to the university and to wider Australian society. We're committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities through teaching and learning, research and community partnerships across all of our campuses. La Trobe University pays our respects to Indigenous Elders past, present and emerging, and will continue to incorporate in Indigenous knowledge systems and protocols as part of our ongoing strategic and operational businesses. Um, we have a guest with us this afternoon from New Zealand, and I'll leave it to her when she starts to do an acknowledgement um, to the, the First Nations people in New Zealand, okay? Um, welcome this afternoon. It's a, it's a sort of special seminar in that it is uh, international uh, FASD Awareness Month, um, rather than the day, they're having a whole month, um, it seems, this year. So um, we're going to have a special seminar uh, with guests who are going to be talking about various aspects of FASD, uh, which is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, I think most people use FASD as the abbreviation, but I might be wrong. Um, so it's great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our first two speakers. We'll have two speakers first, and they'll speak for about half an hour, and then we'll have an opportunity for, for some Q&A. Um, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A box. Um, if you put your questions in there, we'll be able to ask them of the speakers and they'll be able to respond. Um, then we'll have a two or three minute break uh, on the hour and then we'll have our international guest speaker, um, Professor Anita Gibbs from New Zealand. Okay, so if you, you, you're on mute, so nobody can, nobody can ask questions live, but you can put them in the Q&A and we'll deal with them as we go along. So the first speakers this afternoon are Dr. Kieran Begley, who many of you know, who's um, an academic uh, that's part of the Living with Disability Research Centre, part of the discipline of social work and is based up in Bendigo, at the Bendigo campus of La Trobe. And she's presenting with uh, Angelina Bruce, who is a, um, an advocate uh, for FASD, a community advocate. So those two are going to present together and I'll hand over to you, Karen. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, and thank you, Chris, for allowing us to um, utilise this kind of LIDS platform to um, have our event essentially for International FASD Awareness Day or Awareness Month. Um, International FASD Awareness Day is the 9th of the 9th um, in recognition um, of not drinking alcohol for nine months during pregnancy, but it's been really extended um, more recently out into a month long um, event. Um, and as Chris said, I'm a, a researcher here at LIDS, um, but before I was a researcher, I was a social worker. Uh, and in my social work, um, career, I spent a lot of time working with people who have FASD and their families. Um, and I'm here today with my colleague Angeline Bruce, who is a FASD awareness raiser and also a mum to a child with FASD. Uh, and we're both part of the Victorian FASD special interest group. So today is going to have a little bit of a different flavour in that we're going to be um, talking about FASD awareness raising. And then my colleague, um, Professor Anita Gibbs, in the second half is going to talk a little bit about some recent research around FASD. So let's start off with what is FASD. So FASD is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, uh, and it's a neurocognitive disability. And people with FASD have damage to their brain and their central nervous system. And that can lead to challenges with memory, with learning, with attention, with abstract thinking, emotional regulation, social relationships, cause and effect reasoning and day-to-day -day living skills amongst other things as well. And we also um, are becoming really increasingly aware 
that a lot of people with FASD also have physical impairments um, associated with FASD that we're learning more and more about every day. So we're recognising that it's not just um, a brain-based disorder, but actually a whole of body condition. And FASD is caused by alcohol exposure. FASD is caused by alcohol. Um, alcohol exposure in utero, so during pregnancy. And I was going to talk to you about how alcohol is a toxin and what it does, um, but actually I came across um, a video from one of my colleagues uh, who was presenting very recently. Um, and it's a video from the Department of um, Education in Western Australia. And it's a, it's a really neat little video. It's only about two minutes long and it talks about how alcohol can impact the brain as it's forming. So we're gonna have a go at playing um, this video for you. The impact of alcohol on the developing brain affects individuals differently. Based on the pattern of brain growth, we know that the greatest areas of difficulty will typically be in regions of the brain that are further from the brain stem. The impact on specific neurons depends on the timing of alcohol exposure. The brain grows from bottom to top. It begins as a tube, and it is from this tube that brain cells move upward and outward to gradually build the brain. First, glial cells, the support cells of the brain, begin to move upward and outward, branching off from the tube, forming scaffolding that supports the movement of the brain cells, called neurons. The neurons climb up the scaffolding, moving to a specified location, and in some cases, replicating to form more neurons. Some neurons have a short journey, others have a long journey. When alcohol is introduced to the process of brain growth, it may disrupt the cells in many ways, damaging the basic scaffolding, confusing the neurons so they are unsure of where they need to go and or killing the neurons. Because of the upward and outward progression of the neurons and glial cells, the neurons that may be more vulnerable to the exposure of alcohol are those with further to travel, as there is a greater likelihood of misdirection. Alcohol exposure before birth can cause brain injury, which is permanent. The challenges faced by individuals with FASD are a result of these injuries to their brain. When we understand this, we can focus on supporting individuals to develop personal and social capability and the knowledge and skills required for learning and communication. All right, so that gives you some um, ideas around how alcohol can impact the brain. So when we're um, talking about FASD or when we're um, looking at an assessment for FASD, um, we look at 10 different neurodevelopmental or 10 different brain domains. And these are the brain domains. Um, so memory, language, attention, adaptive behavior or day-to-day -day living skills, um, executive functioning, academic achievement, affect regulation, cognition, so IQ, um, motor skills and brain structure and um, neurology. And in order to get a diagnosis of FASD, um, you need to have really significant challenges in at least three of these different brain domains. And when we're saying significant, we're talking about to the um, bottom 2% of the population. So really significant impairments in these areas. Um, but what's important to remember for FASD is that different individuals have different patterns of strengths um, and challenges. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that alcohol can impact um, the brain um, at different times when the brain is forming. Um, and that, mean, that exposure um, means that we have different patterns of impairments for people. So one person, oop, hang on a second, one person with FASD, for example, might have challenges with memory um, and academic achievement, adaptive behaviour and executive functioning, whereas somebody else might have um, challenges with affect regulation, attention and executive functioning. And somebody else with FASD might have challenges with academic achievement, language, um, they may have a low IQ, 
um, problems with adaptive behaviour and executive functioning. You'll notice that I've put executive functioning on all of those slides. Um, executive functioning are those kind of higher order tasks, being able to um, plan things and organise things, being able to link consequences to actions, for example. And most people with FASD um, have challenges with executive functioning. I'm actually going to hand over now though to my colleague, Angeline Bruce, um, who has a child with FASD, and she is gonna tell you a little bit more about FASD from a lived experience point of view. So Angeline, if you can highlight Angeline, spotlight Angeline, that will be great. Okay, thanks. Hi everybody, yeah, my name's Angeline and I am the biological parent to an amazing child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And this is a picture of us here. Um, I believe there is a video that's that's going to be played of, of my story, um, which I'm, I'm very pleased to share today and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, hang on a second, Ange. Of course, technical glitches. I'll just grab that up for you. That's okay. Bear with us, folks. I share screen. It's always fun when you're changing from one screen to another. And there. Can we see that? Beautiful. Hey everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ange. I'm 47 years old and I have a 12 year old son who has diagnosed fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD as it's known. I'm here today to try and bring awareness and to start a conversation around this mostly invisible disability. My belief is that behind every FASD child, there are two stories. There is a story of the mother and there is the story of the child. So I'd like to start with my story. My story began with some early childhood trauma that was external to my family. I had an excellent nuclear family unit, a loving mum, dad and a brother. But I did suffer some external trauma. I found various ways to cope with that when I was a child, which didn't involve alcohol. And as I grew up, I found it an interesting social lubricant, but that's about all. And we'll fast forward to when I was 32 years of age and my, my mother was diagnosed with geoblastoma and subsequently passed away quite quickly. And that was the end of my nuclear family. My life was pretty much destroyed. I self-medicated with alcohol on that. A year later, I found out that I was unable to have children without IVF. I ended up falling pregnant at the age of 34. Hopelessly alcoholic, I was not planning, I was not able to have a child as far as I knew. And so I was 34 years of age, pregnant with my miracle baby and hopelessly alcoholic. When I did find out I was pregnant, I am in the subset of women who were physically dependent on alcohol. I was self-medicating on my mother's death and I was also self-medicating on the fact that I couldn't have children. So you can see the irony in all this when I fell pregnant with my miracle baby. So this is where my story became my son's story. So I did everything that I possibly could throughout my pregnancy except for, except for stop drinking because that was something I was unable to do. So I ate properly, took prenatal vitamins, went to all of the prenatal appointments to make sure my son would have the very best amount of care. So I cut down drinking as much as I possibly could without withdrawing. I did tell, unfortunately, my OBGYN at my very first appointment that I was an alcoholic and that I was in full flight alcoholism. And I was told at that point, that alcohol is no good for the baby and you must give up. And that was it. That was what I was left with. So I did continue telling my story, but I was very less forthcoming about it. It wasn't asked of me again and I didn't bring it up. I didn't feel that I, I could, to be honest. Um, and it is super important to have conversations around this in a non-stigma 
no blame, no shame. This is difficult stuff. This is really, really hard to talk about. And the stigma runs so deep that I understand that nobody, you guys don't probably don't want to ask these kinds of questions. So at 33 weeks, I tried to stop drinking completely again. And I ended up in hospital on a drip to stop labour. It was too early for my son to be born at 33 weeks. I then came home and maintained again. And at 30, almost 36 weeks, I gave up again. I was just sick about the alcohol that was going in every day. Uh, I went into withdrawal, my water spontaneously broke and my son was born eight hours later. So he was quite quick into the world. He was my first child and he was in a hurry. He was in distress. When he was born, it was a very, very silent three or four minutes before I heard my son cry. And I'm grateful every single day uh, that I heard that cry. He required 48 hours of nasal gastric feeding. He had a, a slow suck reflex and he also needed oxygen for 24 hours. I was relieved that he was born and that I wasn't drinking anymore and that he could just get the nutrients he needed and that he wasn't needing to get any of my alcohol anymore. So that brings us on to the next phase, and that is getting diagnosis and finding out things about FASD. Whilst I was pregnant, I Googled everything I possibly could, but the only thing I could really find were facial features, pictures of facial features. And because facial features occur in such a small percentage of these kids, that's all I could go on, facial features. So I'm desperately trying to look for facial features. He had failure to thrive. He found it difficult to put on weight. And his sleeping was, he had a lot of colic problems also. I was desperately trying to believe that he would be fine, that I would be the one that, and he would be the one that would be fine. With the um, developmental milestones is when it started to show through. He crawled when he should have crawled and he pretty much walked when he should have walked. But his language was very, very delayed. He didn't speak and he, he still has speech therapy to this day. Uh, there were eating problems, sleeping problems. And then, of course, once he got a little bit older, three or four, we started to notice the social and emotional issues that he was having. At roughly three years of age, my son was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And, of course, I didn't think that this was correct at the time, I went to seek a second opinion, knowing that I was fairly confident it was more than that. And the second paediatrician I saw was a FASD formed paediatrician, and it only took him two minutes. Yes, this child definitely has FASD with the information you have provided, with his delayed milestones and the fact that he's really starting to struggle socially and emotionally at the moment, that yes, this child definitely has FASD. So there was my diagnosis. And I'd like to say that that was the end of the story and that getting the diagnosis was a fabulous, fabulous thing. Then we needed to move on to the appropriate interventions and accommodations that my son required. This involved speech therapy, occupational therapy, and later on in life, when he was when he became 10, a psychologist. So my son has three fabulous therapists, all of which unfortunately didn't really know a lot about FASD. Unfortunately, when I rang to book them in and I was speaking to reception, they I would be asked, does my son have a diagnosis of ASD? And I would say he doesn't, he has a diagnosis of FASD. And I would invariably be asked what that is. I actually find that to be really disheartening in this day and age and in this country. And it must be terribly difficult for therapists as well. Being the, um, I, I must admit, and I make no apologies, I am that parent. <laughs> so every therapist, I provided with a pack of FASD information, which included my son's diagnosis, his WISC report, which had been pulled 
a part by a FASD informed psychologist. So it actually shows his strengths and weaknesses in those different brain domains and his NDIS plan because he's now on the NDIS. But that also took quite a bit of effort to get there. And to their credit, all of his, his therapists took this on board, have accommodated him well. His speech therapist is, all of his therapists are fabulous. His speech therapist has actually authorised for me to say today that she was originally trying to use a speech therapy model that is chronologically appropriate for my son, who is 12. However, this did not work at all. This resulted in many a meltdown and many just just many devastating sessions really with, with no progress and we're all a bit disheartened about that. My son's speech therapist was lovely and she called somebody that knew a little bit more about it than she did and she then implemented the Libcone program which chronologically, as you would know, is not really used in kids over the age of five, six, seven. But for my 10-year-old 10, 10 at the time, it worked perfectly. My son's occupational therapist also did a course on FASD and I provided them with some educational videos and they all watched them because they were very, very keen to help. One thing I need to let you know about my son is that he does have deficits, but he has an awful lot of strengths and he's a very, very likeable little human being. The next thing I would need to talk about, of course, is schooling. My son was well accommodated for when he was in kindergarten. He did two years of kindergarten. But when he got to primary school, those deficits really started showing through. The sensory issues started coming through. There was too much chatter in the classroom for him. There was too much stimulation. He couldn't sit still in his chair. And by the time he got to grade three, in that particular primary school, it became too large for him. My son now goes to a small mainstream primary school of roughly 90 odd students. And it's actually the same primary school I went to. So that's kind of cool. And within that school, again, they received the pack of the FASD information. They have taken it on board. Being a smaller school, Everybody knows everybody. And that has been really, really important for my son. All FASD children can thrive if they're given the appropriate accommodations. These accommodations for my son look like there are timeout cushions for him. His teacher will ask him every 15 minutes or so if he needs a brain break because he's not able to articulate that. He just gets overwhelmed with this, the input and because his processing is slower, it takes him that little bit longer to be able to process what's said. So if instruction, too many instructions are given at once, he can't follow them. But he will tell you that he understands because he's really good at social cues. So his teacher will actually ask him if he needs a brain break. And at that point, he'll say yes, but he won't ask for one. He has cushions that he can go to. He has... He loves to read. My son is extraordinary at reading. Within the different brain domains, you will often see that their results will be all over the place. So my son's receptive language is excellent. So he will read novels. But his expressive language, his speech, and his ability to make up an abstract story, he cannot do that. It's not possible for him. So with all these accommodations in place at his primary school, he is actually doing quite well at the moment. So for any therapists, OTs, speeches, psychologists out there, I hope this has helped a little bit. Uh, my dream in the future, my, my vision, I suppose, for the future is that all of the clinicians that are very well versed in autism will be as well versed in FASD. All right. I'm just going to stop share there. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, Angeline. And Angeline, just while I'm getting my slides, um, Angeline's on the road at the moment. She's actually up in Canberra. Um, and Angeline does a lot of awareness um, raising around FASD. Do you want to, um, while I'm grabbing the slides back up, explain to people what you've been doing up in Canberra for this last week? Absolutely. Um, I have been 
uh, Monday and Tuesday, we held a Rethink Addiction Convention. It was the inaugural Rethink Addiction Convention up here in Canberra. And we covered a, a plethora of, we covered gambling, um, alcohol and other drugs. And we also covered um, FASD. So I was there as the parent of a FASD child um, to explain you know, a little bit about FASD and what basically my story was there. And um, yeah, so I, I explained about FASD, explained that it can actually occur even though we were at a Rethink Addiction Convention. I just ex wanted to explain that it can occur at really, really low levels of drinking as well. And that's why you will see that our alcohol labelling has changed. They need to do it by June 2023, but you'll notice that the the little tiny pregnant cross ladies, they're, they're gone and they're replaced with a pregnancy health black, white and red warning, which is reflective of how dangerous alcohol is in any amount to, to a child. And that includes before you, before you found out you're pregnant and um, at you know really low levels as well. My particular story is um, of a physically dependent woman. So that's my subset of women that I intend to support. Uh, but of course, I'm about all things FASD. So yeah, I'm up here doing that and it, it was fabulous. Thanks, Ange. Um, so when Angeline and I got together and we were, we were planning this, we were thinking, um, you know, what focus do we want to have? Um, oh, I think, Yelena, I'm not sure if I'm spotlighted, so you might just want to check that. Um, but, you know, what focus do we want to have for International FASD Awareness Day? And one of the things that we decided was that we really wanted to kind of unpack this idea of FASD as an invisible disability um, because we know that a lot of people don't know about FASD, but a lot of people also wonder why we don't know about FASD. Um, so from our, I suppose, point of view, FASD is definitely not invisible. Um, people with FASD have quite significant um, impairments and it affects their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and they have a lot of challenges, but despite this, they're often not identified. And as a result of that, people with FASD often don't get the support that they need and um, parents don't get the support that they need as well. So we thought we might run through um, some of the reasons for why we think that FASD is hidden and Angeline's gonna start us off around prevalence. Yeah, uh, the prevalence is, is very high. Um, as we can see, the misconception is that FASD is uncommon. And I understand that there um, will be people um, with autism in this webinar. So um, I, this is, I'd like for, my dream is for, you know, spectrums to, to work together rather than an us and them. So um, please don't take offense, these are just facts. Um, yeah, FASD is more common than autism down syndrome and spina bifida combined. At the moment we estimate our prevalence at about 2% because we don't have a, a really current study, but there have been current studies in Canada, um, America and Ireland that put their prevalence rate at 5%. And we have done studies that indicate that as Australians, we drink more than, than those countries. So the 2% is a really conservative figure. And I like to use um, visual examples. So I like to, whenever I see something over 100,000, I like to image the MCG. So that's a whole MCG full of, of kids or, and adults um, with FASD plus 20,000 more. And that's only at 2%. So that's really, really conservative. We, we really think that it's really more about four or 5% in this country. Yeah, and we're, and we're, we're thinking, so the international prevalence rate is two to 5%. Um, there have been no um, widespread prevalence studies in Australia, but there have been some um, population-based prevalence studies. So we found out recently in a um, youth detention centre in Western Australia that 36% of the young people were affected by FASD. Um, but this 2% and 120,000 people is, you know, if we take 2% of the Victorian population, it's 120,000 people. It's a lot of people. It's um, an MCG. Yeah, it's an MCG. Um, there's also a bit of a misconception out there that you can identify people with FASD because they have specific facial features. Um, and that's not in, entirely untrue. Um, there are facial features associated with FASD, 
Um, but FASD is a spectrum and 89% of people with FASD don't have any uh, vis visible physical uh, facial features or other visible um, features of the condition. Um, and what the reason for that is that in order to have facial features for FASD, the fetus has to be exposed to alcohol when those facial features are forming. Uh, and those facial features are forming, and correct me, Angela, if I'm wrong, it's about day 17 to day 21 of development. 17 to 21. So um, if, if you picture a, um, a, a lady who is uh, maybe not know they're pregnant or even they are, and they've, they've been drinking on a weekend, and so if they don't drink Monday to Friday and those five days fall in that and then they drink the next weekend, their child will have no facial features at all. So that's, yeah. That's how that works. And that's why 89% have no facial features. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose the take home message is we can't tell if somebody has FASD just by looking at them. That's correct. I'll hand over to you, Ange. Another misconception is that FASD only occurs in particular populations, uh, and that would be uh, disadvantaged communities, our First Nation communities, and physically dependent women such as myself. Um, I've already so I've already suggest, um, told you that it, it can occur in really low levels. Um, and uh, my partner actually is working at a um, quite an affluent uh, Lutheran primary school as an IT tech. And so he did ask this special ed teacher if she knew what FASD was. She didn't. Um, he explained it to her and uh, she said, oh, okay, now I see that. Um, no, no, no. They're in the eastern suburbs of, of Melbourne. And and she said, no, this is a very affluent area. We have autism and we have ADHD, but we don't have FASD here. We're, it's, we're just not that kind of area. So it's a really big misconception. Uh, it doesn't play by socioeconomic rules at all. Wherever alcohol is, it will follow. Uh, another misconception is that alcohol is a condition that affects children. Um, and it's, understand, it's easy to understand why um, people think this. FASD has the word fetal in it, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, and most of, when we look at kind of clinical practice or any practice um, across different areas, at the moment in Australia, but also internationally, the focus has been on identifying and supporting children. Um, most of the research around FASD is on children and most of the training um, around FASD has either uh, an intentional focus on children or, um, you know, implicit focus on children. And we found that out in a recent scoping uh, review that I've done recently with my research colleagues is that there's actually very little adult content um, on FASD and adults. But FASD is a lifelong condition. The, the damage that happens as a result of alcohol exposure is permanent um, and, it's, um, and it's life long. Children don't outgrow FASD and teens and adults have um, FASD of course. It's just that if they're not identified in childhood they're often not identified uh, and this is a real challenge because really it's only been the last 10 or 15 years that Australia has been identifying people with FASD at all. We only had the introduction of the Australian Diagnostic Guidelines in 2016 um, so there are a lot of people out there in the community that have FASD and we haven't identified it and we're not supporting them. Over to you, Ange. Uh, yep, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, misdiagnosis and co-occurring uh, co disorders are a very common thing. Uh, it is estimated, or sorry, there's been studies in Canada and the US that at least 60% of children with FASD will have coexisting ADHD and my son falls in the 40%. He doesn't have ADHD, but uh, the majority will have coexisting ADHD. However, stimulants can often make things a whole lot worse. Um, and as we can see, there's, there's a lot of other stuff. There's um, ODD, RAD, uh, global developmental delay. My son was diagnosed with much younger. Um, then he was diagnosed with autism at, at three and there's conduct disorder as well in there as well. So there are some people often call it when um, when going for a diagnosis and it's, it's 
been really difficult. Some people refer to it as they've received an alphabet soup prior to getting their, their actual FASD diagnosis. Yeah. And it, it's, it mimics, uh, it's, there's absolutely no blame here from me for any clinicians because it's the, it's the most, um, I was, a lot of women are not asked at diagnosis whether there was any alcohol during pregnancy. And it's just, it's the most obvious conclusion to jump to because there are, the crossover symptoms are, are plenty. There, there's a lot of crossover. So, you know, in their defense, as Karen said, we're just learning more about phase D. And so the obvious diagnosis to run to is uh, to go with is autism because it mimics autism really, really um, closely, although the interventions need to be very phase D specific and different. Thanks for that. Um, so there's been a lot of studies on lots of different professional groups internationally, um, looking at their knowledge and understanding of FASD. And all of those studies have come to the same conclusion, um, which is that professionals have very limited knowledge and understanding of FASD. Um, a study, I've also uh, done a study in this area um, in social service or social care professionals and mental health professionals. Um, and we found that um, professionals believe that FASD is relevant to their practice um, and their work. And they think that uh, people, that the people that they're working with are likely to have FASD, but they don't know how to identify it. They don't know how to diagnose it. They're not sure how to provide appropriate support and interventions. Another, an important thing um, to be mindful of as a professional and something that we found out in this study as well, is that professionals, um, you know, while they see it as relevant to their practice, they also believe that the ultimate responsibility for supporting people with FASD sits with another professional. So people working in mental health think that FASD is an issue for disability services um, and people, in disability for services think it's a drug and alcohol issue. Um, and so the reality for people with FASD is that they often access a huge range of different services um, because they come across professionals um, who don't necessarily understand their needs and believe that they can refer them on to another professional and then they don't understand their needs or, or are able to provide that support. Um, and in the end, they, they access all of these services, but don't have their needs met. Um, we also know that FASD diagnosis can be particularly hard to access, that there's long waiting lists, um, and that there are no diagnostic services for teenagers and adults. So um, for a lot of people with FASD, they're going into services um, without a diagnosis to be able to say, I have FASD. Um, Another kind of element to that though, because I think there's a lot of focus on how can we train professionals to be FASD informed? And that's really, really important to be able to recognize FASD. And that's really, really important. But I think there's a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, and what I found in a, in a different study um, on professionals kind of views and values around FASD is that professionals' personal experiences of alcohol consumption and of pregnancy influence um, how or whether they engage with FASD. So for example, um, one of the psychiatrists in one of the studies said, some of my colleagues have said, oh, I really don't like to think about fetal alcohol because you know, I think of when I was pregnant or I drank a tiny bit or I drank quite a lot or my wife was pregnant. Um, and a pediatrician said, I think we all just try and keep deluding ourselves. My GP doesn't like to ask me about my alcohol use. It's funny, he doesn't want to go there, but I think it's because he drinks like I do. And so he doesn't want to have to think about it himself. We don't consider ourselves problem drinkers, but we drink very much like uh, an awful lot of our peers, which is more than the alcohol health, uh, health watch booklet suggests. Um, so, you know, this is kind of indicating to us that um, there are non-clinical kind of frames of reference that professionals are using 
um, to, you know, the influences their practice around FASD um, and that it's probably not enough to raise awareness um, and through, through training, but we actually have to um, critically think about how these personal elements impact whether people will engage um, and ask the question, um, you know, about FASD or alcohol use during pregnancy. And then there's this. Uh, there is a lot of stigma around FASD. And uh, whenever we have tried to, to educate the public or to get any information out um, with regard to the FASD, it invariably ends up being even more stigmatised. Um, so it, it is a stigmatised thing because it involves alcohol in pregnancy and, and that makes everybody just a little bit uncomfortable. But when we've got headlines like this, um, that it, booze babies left brain damage by their mothers drinking are costing taxpayers 115 million a year. Um, had I have not already disclosed my alcohol, I, well, I disclosed and had I have not already had my son, you know, diagnosed, accommodated, all that kind of stuff, um, that would definitely have, have been a huge barrier for me to come forward, even if I wanted to, because that in itself is extremely judgmental. So even when we try and educate, it often ends up being even more stigmatised. And that's a, a tweet that I put up that I can't quite see all of it. Um, but yeah, I, I believe that in a, in a country where drinking is encouraged, it's advertised through sports and all that kind of stuff, every, it's everywhere really. So women are actively encouraged to drink, but then we dump on them and shame them when they do just that in pregnancy or they become dependent and, and fall pregnant as well. And yeah, that stigma, it, it really needs to end. So is FASD invisible? Well, we would argue FASD is not invisible, but it's certainly hidden. Um, and it's hidden for all of the reasons that we've talked about today. Um, and there's a lot of work, systemic work to do at lots of different levels to ensure that we support people with FASD and their families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much that I've learned, just learned so much in the last 40 minutes. Um, okay, so we might start again. I've already sort of partially introduced uh, Anita. Um, Anita is a um, professor uh, at the University of Otago who specializes in work around people with FASD. And as I heard you write, you're also um, a parent of a young person with FASD. Um, and you're going to talk about best practices for justice when my dog be quiet. Um, so I'll hand over to you and put myself on mute. So thank you very much for joining us um, from New Zealand today, Anita. Mm. Well, kia ora uh, koutou. Um, Kei uh, nga maunga whakahi, kei nga wai tuku kiri, kei nga mata waka otu motu ka nui te mihi. To those who connect to the mountains, the rivers and oceans across the land, hello and welcome to you all. Obviously, welcome to the land of the long white cloud, Aotearoa, but also acknowledge um, the traditional uh, custodians of um, Australia. And thank you for the opportunity to share um, some of my research with you today. Um, I'm just going to introduce my um, mountain, uh, which is the in the background there. Ko Dart Mo Te Moonga, Ko X Te Awa, Ko Anglo-Saxon Toku Iwi, Ko Devonian Toku Hapu, Ko Exeter Cathedral Toku Morai, Noinga Rangia Ho, and Gari Ke Otapoti Toku Kayanga, Ko Anita Gibbs Toku Ingwa, Tena Koto Tena Koto Tena Tato Katoa. So basically, uh, I link back to um, the UK, to Devon in particular, and my mountain place is Dartmoor and my um, original uh, town is Exeter, but my current town is uh, Dunedin, uh, where I am, yes, um, busy, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and um, I have two, um, three children, two, one biological, two adopted, uh, and the adopted children um, from uh, Russian heritage originally, uh, still are, very much Russians, uh, but very much Kiwis and, and also have British citizenship. We um, have lived together as a forever family uh, for 17 years um, since our boys came to us as toddlers. And 
we have a, a range of uh, the alphabet diagnosis uh, in, in the family in relation to neurodivergent condi conditions, including FASD. So I have a great passion, um, not surprisingly. But I, the talk today is on some research that I've been doing. Um, haven't yet had enough time to do enough analysis. It's so frustrating. But anyway, I've got one bit that I can chat to. And this is about practices, um, perspectives really from justice practitioners on understanding youth, uh, young people living with FASD. I've undertaken, in fact, I've undertaken two projects with 90 qualitative interviews. And I know you'll know that's a lot of interviews um, with people who are wanting to talk about FASD. Uh, 41 in particular with what we would call stakeholders, so people with a lot of experience and very FASD informed and, um, you know, with a, with a lot of vested interest. So 11 um, of them, though, uh, because we're sort of narrowing it down as we go along, had significant experiences of justice, um, particularly with young people, but, but also just beyond that. Um, and in the courts and in other ways, um, we, we basically, um, yeah, undertook uh, qualitative interviews and ask lots of questions um, about, uh, you know, what, what does um, your work entail? What are you actually doing in terms of FSD? What are, what are your concerns and interests about FASD? What do you see that it's missing? What, what's actually working well? If, if there is something that's working well, what, what system change do you want to see? What does wellbeing look like? So I'm just going to reflect on some of those uh, questions from the analysis, particularly um, from the professionals, um, stakeholders that I've spoken to in relation to justice. But obviously, there's some great work in Australia. I mean, loads of, um, I was just thinking about all the different researchers that I've read publications of and, and come to know through various networks. Um, phenomenal, um, fantastic work going on throughout Australia, uh, as well as internationally. But, you know, we don't have a lot going on in New Zealand. We've had some good um, material, but we don't have a lot of um, enough research, shall we say. Uh, but we know from experience that there are high rates of young um, people and adults who, who are involved in justice, who have mostly undiagnosed FASD, but who are definitely suspected to have FASD and other neurodivergent conditions. Um, we know that as we've already hinted at in our part one of this session, the staff working in the field of justice are often fleetingly trained. We know that. I mean, I teach social work students, I teach sociology students, I teach criminology students, and they get obviously the up to date stuff from me, but they've never had it from anybody else. And I never had it in my own training. So it's very early days in terms of base education, which we need to see a lot more of. Um, so they're not necessarily chained to work in a way that we would call neuro informed practices that understand disability and particularly critical disability studies. It just hasn't come into base training sufficiently for many professions and allied professions, as well as social work and justice professions. So we know there's a gap. Um, and we also know that long term justice entrenchment, which often starts early, we've got some great researchers again in Australia who've talked about that care to prison pipeline um, and mirrored in some of the conversations we have in New Zealand, is that the early justice involvement can set people up on, on a pathway uh, to criminalization, particularly those with cognitive disabilities, um, neurodivergent conditions, the language is important, uh, FASD. Um, and their families, their families being a family member um, with a lot of justice experience, uh, I know uh, their families get dragged into all manner of chaos and distress. So 11 professionals uh, spoke to me more in depth uh, around um, justice work. So we had a couple of social workers. We had a couple of police officers with a particular special youth focus, a prison chaplain, a psychologist specialing in youth um, criminal justice matters, a couple of legal professionals. Um, and I've got to be really careful. I can't say too much about each of these because New Zealand is such a small place and I have to keep as much as possible um, the anonymity and confidentiality. Uh, three other professionals who had extensive communication language expertise, education provision experience, um, and helping young people transition out of justice settings. So um, the details there, we did have three out of the 11 who had family members who'd been through justice. So they had a lived experience alongside um, professional and um, you know, other experience. So I'm just gonna talk about key themes and, and then obviously discuss what, what that looks like in terms of what we need to do about it. Um, highlighting, of course, um, wonderful sets of uh, comments and communications. I mean, 
this is part of the course and it's part of the fact that we're not prepared to recognize what we're doing to young people or adults that we just are using jails to be our disability services so um I, I was listening to the I've been listening to the Royal Commission for Abuse and Care inquiry avidly. I know you've got one going on in Australia, but I'm talking about the New Zealand one. And um, there was a quote recently of somebody saying, you know, that, that we uh, we're operating a very expensive failure model. <laughs> uh, and given that there's hundreds of thousands of dollars to look after people every year in, in a wholly inadequate environment for those people if they have neurodivergent conditions I mean it's bad enough for anyone who doesn't uh, but it's wholly inadequate and won't meet their needs you know we have so much ignorance intolerance and incompetence the quotes here you know talk about people being blamed for you know their behaviors because nobody's understanding what's happening in the brain that the brain is a physical lifelong injury uh, they're constantly um, feeling excluded and they you know leave school early the system has failed a person time and time again nobody recognizes the disability so if we don't recognize it how will we ever give proper support another comment everyone kind of gets thinks that young people getting into trouble and we've seen loads of headlines about ram raids and all sorts in in new zealand recently you know that they, they get annoyed with people they, they think they're feral young people are just out there you know uh, it with you know, in chaos, basically, and not completing the tasks demanded of them. But I mean, of course, my view would always be, well, what are you actually asking of them? You know, have they got any hope of completing your demanding tasks? Have you ever made any accommodations for them? Anyway, they're not approaching people in an FASD manner. So they end up being penalised and punished. Uh, and, you know, more rules get put upon them. Uh, people think they're being naughty. No, they're not. So basically, this comment could be mirrored, I'm sure, in Australia. I don't think we're a very tolerant or empathetic society in New Zealand. Um, I know the criminologist John Pratt has written quite about it, a bit about our authoritarian um, and intolerant society generally, but especially towards people who offend. And it seems even more mirrored towards those who have um, significant neurodivergent conditions, neurodisabilities. Um, a number of people talked about missed opportunities, the, mis, you know, the misunderstood, the misdiagnosed, um, and so forth, as well as that sort of mistreated because of those missed opportunities to diagnose. It's just a catalog of missed opportunities you think why did nobody think to do something maybe somebody did but you know what professional early on got what might have gone mm, what can we do can we can we keep them out of court can we divert them uh, can we get them assessed it, it, it wasn't in the it's not been in the toolbox i know i worked in criminal justice myself uh many decades ago in the uk but i didn't know about brain injury Simply, I did not know truly about the impact of, of, of brain injury or traumatic um, brain injury or prenatal alcohol exposure impact or any of those things. And so I worked with clients and I was trying to reason them into good behavior, pure and simple, because that was the research that we had. Whereas now people, once they know and can be trained and actually can ask the questions, perhaps they can be saying, hmm, does this person need an assessment? There's something not adding up here. Uh, often the judges, uh, some of the judges in New Zealand are, are saying we need to ask those questions. Systems that are wrong, that see uh, kids facing terrible adversity on top of their disability, which makes life hard by being misunderstood and mistreated. It's like it's already a tough life. Probably there's been ad early adversity. There may be some other struggles going on at home. There may be adverse childhood experiences. Then you layer on the fact they've got somebody with an undiagnosed disability and then they end up in trouble and then they get layered on and layered on of disapproval and um, ultimately mistreatment, some of it quite abusive. Um, so also the our group of children can be um, easily misled. You know, people will take advantage of them fully. We see that those of us are caregivers all of the time. Um, and as a result, sometimes our children might not know what's, what's appropriate behavior. They do stuff, they get themselves into trouble, and it seems to repeat itself too often, sadly, kind of over and over. The justice professionals I spoke to who were quite experienced talked about the immense effort that they had to make to essentially train themselves. And they had to make a journey in that because it wasn't obvious and it wasn't you know, covered, as I say, in their training. And so they had to go do research. So a lot of them talked about um, light bulb moments and uh, 
some a family pestering them or once they heard about the diagnosis a family member taught them um, someone um, who's not part of research study but has worked with my family members you know talk about learning from my young one in particular learning the most from that my son in particular that training them you know that they'd never had as much teaching but from one person because they spent so much time with him that was their uh, greatest learning um, so here's a couple of quotes you know worked in the youth service for 20 years I became away through this uh, became aware through staff training of at FASD I was fascinated um, I had no clear understanding of it prior to that so that was about 14 years working in the service and saying oh you're just bad so you know that person was it was real light bulb moment stuff because they had been in this you know you've got to have learned by now and if you haven't and you're offending surely you're it's really very planned and deliberate and reasoned behavior therefore you are naughty therefore you should be punished but no once they understood the brain and the brain impairments it was like ah I need to learn more another person the lights went on for me it changed my life so that real kind of turnabout stuff I realized that I uh, you know that we'd been missing a more viable explanation for the behavior so huge um you know revelations to people I suppose um and that they by the understanding that uh and not responding appropriately in fact we're not addressing the real issues and the science, so one person was doing a lot of research, you know, just to look at the brain science. He, um, that person said, well, I, I was reading, it was uncontroversial, it was rock solid, brain da damage, you know, affected or affects behaviours in ways that predispose those with impairments to enter the criminal justice system. I thought, wow, that, there's some overwhelming evidence here about the significance and status of neurodisabilities and FASD in particular. So, hmm, some big questions there to be pondering if um, you're a professional in trying to learn more and it's there's so much research to access I mean it's very easy you've got the fast hub in Australia you've got no fast D in Australia you've got um, telethon you've got oh you've got so many um, centers uh, of wonderful research and so many individual researchers and advocates and beautiful um, people working to highlight um, what FASD is in particular and how to work and assist families and diagnostic centers I mean I know all my Australian um, colleagues and friends will say no we need more we need more money yes I agree you need a lot more money to make it um, more integrated and uh, you know, available across Australia but um, certainly the information and training potentially for people who seek but you've obviously got to get on that journey to seek um, so yeah well-being was a big deal you know I said to people what kind of um, things come to mind with well-being well at a basic level not coming back to the court you know actually avoiding more justice if you've had justice experience but there was more to it you know thriving I want to see people thriving doing the things they love doing like like other children like other children who are neurodiver uh, neurotypical sorry um, other children who have a chance to participate equally in life that's kind of you know a disability rights approach uh, but certainly doing the things they love feeling good about themselves because so often this discrimination starts early for children it starts in preschool where they're getting judged at really quite an early age and microaggressions occurring to them throughout their education so they get that sense of rejection quite early uh, and obviously well-being would be a counter to that it looks like who they're meant to be being accepted being valued being tolerated being supported having the chance to fully participate in all aspects of life and that's no mean feat and a lot of young people with FASD may not be there yet unless they've got some significant wraparound uh, and you know um, FASD informed supports of course well-being isn't just about the child the young person it's about their far now their family it's about what caregivers do uh, if caregivers are exhausted and I run a lot of caregiver support groups you know and often it's the burnout that really is um you know so challenging because it's relentless the intensity of um the hyperactive or active child or just dealing with all the systems and the child um, is relentless so well-being for caregivers is critical to success well we have to support the caregivers we have to start believing them sometimes caregivers will tell me their story is just not believed they're not believed in terms of the 
intensity of um, challenge that they might face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, when they come and ask for help, we have to provide regular ongoing support. And so often it's a one or two hour a week. Well, that's not good enough for, for many families. They need daily help, daily support in a range of areas, uh, multitude of areas they may request help for. I take my hat off to thousands of families throughout New Zealand, but it's totally exhausting. So, I mean, um, and the chair of the child needs to be shared. It needs to be shared with other people. That's that team, the village around a child, of course. Uh, but other people who need to understand, it's no good sharing the care with people who get very impatient and go like, well, back to you. Um, two hours with him is enough. Thank you very much. Um, there needs to be funded services. Of course, that's that funded infrastructure of services. Well, we haven't got much of that that, um, that we need in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, so that the families can obviously connect and um, into the services. They can call when they're in trouble. They can have support come um, and people to come in and help and just to yeah give them a bit of respite. But it's a perennial issue that comes up in every caregiver group that I run. We just don't have enough respite. So well-being also is about fundamental human and disability rights. Um, and people did reiterate time and time again, they should be able to have the same life um, that somebody who doesn't have a disability has. That might look different. Their sense of thriving might look different, but they still have a right to that. We need to respect people's rights. And we're not used to doing that sufficiently in the justice context. And our justice professionals agree that the system is not set up uh, to necessarily operate from a disability rights perspective. It's obviously set up in a kind of you know, offender victim, victim offender, um, kind of binary opposition um, type of approach. And that, you know, it is the offender who needs to change their behavior. But we need to go back to uh, what are, if a person has a lifelong disability, we've got to identify what are some of their rights. Um, and of course, understanding rights of victims are important too. So then we talked about uh, best practices and we had a whole range of best practices identified not surprisingly ones that we've already mentioned in this session so far get an early diagnosis then we can have a plan to touch uh, the different areas where the diagnosis has been very explicit and detailed particularly in the case of FASD if we notice there's communication difficulties we get that speech language in early could be that people need occupational therapy uh, for sensory related. It could be they might need buddies just to uh, participate in some social activities. There's a whole range of ways, as this these quotes say. Um, and then best practices is having people you can go to who go like FASD. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, and there are many more in Aotearoa than there used to be. But at the same time, it's still like not in every city, not in every um, population group, we uh, have not got what we would call enough specifically knowledgeable practitioners because they need training before they qualify and they obviously need to be able to work with families that have been identified as in need of support for this specific disability. Obviously, people talked about other things like BASD navigators. Um, we've got a few, we've got about a handful in New Zealand. People, again, who've been trained, knowledgeable, often caregivers with uh, professional training and skills that, that are paid and come alongside families and individuals to identify what the needs are, how they can troubleshoot, go along to meetings with uh, families, uh, scaffold some of the supports that families need. Uh, you know, sometimes parents find this frustrating, particularly if they're, they're strong caregivers, that they have a navigator who seems to get more information than them and and they say well why can't people actually you know dialogue direct with the family and, and support the family more adequately but at the same time they recognize it's exhausting if you've got maybe 10 professionals in your life if you've got a plan that's 15 to 20 hours a week that you've got to work out who's going where how to do this and maybe if you're trying to hold down a job you know a FAS navigator will be a, a massive asset in most cases if, if they have got the knowledge that they need in order to really be attuned to your family and the needs of your family uh, even in you know where you, when family members are going through justice uh, so these are the sorts of comments with the within a navigation role and perhaps um, not always that is a very specialist role but if um, people are going through justice services you know it would still be wonderful if there are 
opportunities for kind of wraparound services. Um, some of the youth justice services do operate that well way where they are trying to use the justice uh, provision to, you know, um, provide a strand of services based on a good assessment. Um, supporting family first, supporting the child, focusing on strengths and skills, because we all know, as Angeline said, our children have wonderful qualities and skills, um, but that often doesn't get recognised. Sometimes they need alternative education and it's incredibly hard for families to get. And uh, that could be the difference between being locked up in a youth justice residence or not just having alternative education. People talked about in terms of best practices, in some cases using specific FASD models. There's um, the internationally uh, recognized eight magic keys. It's very similar to something called the 5S model that a number of practitioners use uh, in New Zealand. And that's kind of like support, supervision, scaffolding. Um, yeah, uh, I can't remember what the 5S's are, but it's basically uh, sort of looking at, you know, kind of concrete um, focused ways and uh, keeping it simple um, is another one to support the person um, and, and then give them, you know, the best possible uh, instructions, if you like, and um, illustrations. And it's usually things like also um, helping young people have picture based images of their justice plans um, that the speech language or an occupational therapist might have helped prepare so that they can actually understand what's expected to them expected of them either through the process of planning or, or having to go to court all of that sort of stuff um, they talked about um, the brain domains using the brain domains to um, once a report has been filed and then to try and actually work with a uh, young person and, and their family to support different areas where there were more significant impairment shall we say lots of uh, common phrases that are used in FASD conversations, can't, no, not won't is a really popular one. It's not about them being wanting, difficult and awkward and ob obtrusive and, and you know, really um, naughty. It's about the fact they can't because the, the instructions are too overwhelming. Brain, not blame. That's understanding the brain is impaired. Why are we blaming the individual for something they were born with? They didn't choose these impairments. They have to live with them. We should be helping them, um, standing alongside them. Um, then also a few um, people talked about mildly specific approaches using particular bicultural um, models and um, just having a lens that would use appropriate um, tikanga, as we call it, processes um, and uh, value-based systems that would actually make it easier for Māori young people and their families to feel safe, to feel culturally safe in uh, the justice context, which is a context where people feel pretty stressed and pressurised. Now I've got to work, be conscious of um, time. Um, people talk about best practices for justice specifically, of course, and, and we, we have um, international, um, you know, a, lo a lot of research and publications about the need for diversion. Um, and that, you know, that really at the end of the day, um, we need to find ways to divert disabled children. So we do need to identify disabled children. Um, we don't want them to enter the justice system. We don't want any child to have involvement in justice in reality, but particularly those with extra vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, if they have contact with police, we want the police to go, mm -mm, you know, we need to use every power that we have to divert. We need to divert you know, not once, twice, three times, we might have to try and work out a way and work out alternatives without the need to formally go to court three, four, five times. I've seen examples in RTRO where people have been quite proactive in doing that for not too serious offending, um, that each time they've actually gone for a, a discharge or not even gone to court through a planning process and then worked out the supports and um, and helps that a family has needed so that the young person um, is kept busy and has got their alternative education and is not getting themselves into so much peer related difficulties uh, because of their vulnerability. So it can happen, but it doesn't happen enough, I suppose. Uh, but once in the system, again, um, you know, we have um, possibilities at all stages. So we need communication assistance. It took us, um, we were just as um, involved, it took us four years from the recommendation to get a communication assistant to actually get one. Um, and, and since the um, advent of that assistance throughout the justice processes um, and then in home support, fantastic uh, 
understanding, comprehension, insight levels, a lot um, has been achieved through having that. And we should have just had it a lot earlier, but we didn't get it. Um, so specialist courts would be helpful. There are a few in place, but where, you know, that focuses on neurodiversity, um, as well as the overlap with co-occurring mental health and other um, challenges that people face. We need this specialist knowledge, this, this, this quote. Um, you know, without this speci specialist knowledge and skill set, our children continue to be treated as neurotypical, which is not probably going to work. Well, we know it won't work. Uh, they're highly stigmatized. If we have more problem solving justice process or court process, um, you know, is as well as police, that includes police being informed specialist lawyers and justice social workers and correction officers, we're bound to find that our justice system will become more tolerant. No surprises there. Um, how do we make our justice system more tolerant? Um, they need to be informed. A lot of the um, time, um, you know, in, in analyzing this material, people talked about the changes to systems and or attitudes. So it sort of broadly fell into, you know, needing to change resourcing, the acceptance of the disability rather than pretend it's not doesn't exist, early screening, training, changed uh, practice, and then going back to obviously prevention activities as well, so that we can reduce the numbers um, of people um, having FASD. So just a few quote quotes on resourcing. Um, we need resourcing. I mean, obviously we need that infrastructure. We had a plan in New Zealand, but we um, haven't updated that plan. And we don't really have a lot of money attached to that plan. And we have pockets of money for different things, but we haven't got what we call a national strategy that's got money attached to it. Uh, so we need resourcing, obviously, um, to alleviate those difficulties. It's way cheaper than imprisoning. I mean, we say this so often, don't we, across the board, um, but somehow we still put billions into a, a imprisoning disabled people. And if it can be classed as a disability, it's um, got to have lifelong funding to go with it. Again, some people will get short amounts of funding, but they don't, and, and they end up in justice. They can do quite well. A lot of um, people give me examples of under 18 year olds who had some supports during their teens when they went a bit wayward and they were kept out of further justice. But as soon as they hit 18, all of those funded supports stopped. And then boom, they were in the adult justice system and things were going rapidly downhill. These quotes, acceptance as a disability. Um, but I guess what people with FASD need is they need for the government and all systems across education, health, justice, social development to understand it is a real disability. You know, it's not a, it's not a, um, you know, oh, here today, gone tomorrow. It's, it's, I mean, people have been accused of making this up. I mean, honestly, I've heard people, well qualified people saying there's no such thing. It's just another fad like ADHD. And I, those of you who know much about ADHD, again, it's this idea that neurodivergent conditions, because we are who are neurotypical enablers, don't understand them. Well, therefore, they can't exist. It's a sort of like, oh, I don't understand it. Therefore, I'll just go. Um, no, it's, it's, it's just a fashion. Um, we know too much now to know the impact of um, prenatal alcohol exposure. Too much good science um, to be poo-pooing it. Um, so the acceptance is actually real. We need to see that happen. That's why we've got FASD Awareness Month. So we need to campaign and advocate and continue the conversations. We need to enable them to be people that they can be and don't judge them for their problems because it's just terrible to see all these children growing up feeling bad about themselves because they've got a disability. We, I mean, unless you actually spend time with these children, you have no idea how the self-esteem and the, um, the, the, the stigma truly impacts the individual and their, their sense of manner, well-being, um, who they are as a person. The families feel that profoundly. They know it profoundly. That's just a quote on um, the need for early screening, picking them up early because the schools see them, they see the behaviour. Where can they send these children to to get good assessments? You know, we need to have more screening processes in place throughout the entire education system so that the children can actually get assessed early. Uh, training, I've kind of said enough on training, um, but basically, yeah, it's got to become core. I'd love to see it core in social work, my own profession, but I'd love to see it core across a range of disciplines. Uh, I haven't seen enough of it in um, psychology training, uh, medical training, or just, you know, police training. Ah. <laughs> um, changed practice or attitudes. Well, this is an interesting quote. You know, you need to think about neurodisability and ableism and, and, you know, think about what assumptions are around the expectations because they're in their own neurotypical world. That's, you know, 
uh, other practitioners, um, so to speak. What does that look like? What are the rules? What are the layers of expectation that they're placing on young people who are uh, neurodivergent, have FASD? Is it, um, you know, too much? We talk about these things, you know, brain not blame. Think about it. If you understand the brain, you'll be less likely to blame. But the change has to come from the top. That was a quote. A quote. Um, it's got to be, you know, a kind of national project or program, national training, national project. Um, and it's got to obviously focus on those prevention. The Canadians are very good at giving us fantastic models of prevention and intervention. Um, but it's also got to recognize that if you're going to diagnose somebody and give them an FASD diagnosis, you, you need to give them follow up care. You can't just a lot of people say, well, I got the diagnosis. Now what? got no services so back to prevention is critical in New Zealand we've still got to face up to our serious alcohol binge culture and uh, the you know the alcohol marketing we've got to find ways you know a lot of my participants I wasn't talking specifically about prevention but that was a focus for them they wanted to see the reduction of the harm of alcohol uh, ultimately we got to face this as a society so just coming to a few slides um, of discussion um, in, you know, my kind of thoughts are really, um, you know, we do need to get on the journey. Obviously, a number of us are everybody sitting around the table today. We're, we're on a journey um, and we've actually got to uh, as, a, as youth justice uh, professionals or working or adult justice professionals. Yeah, absolutely understand that involvement with criminal justice is harmful. So the, the more we can divert and keep them out of justice processes so we need to get better at offering disability services instead of justice services right at the outset for young people when they first um before they even go off the rails you know when parents and caregivers identify hey i need some extra help um we need to change the expectations placed upon anybody going through that justice journey um we want to see champions uh, because we need a national kind of coordinated strategy we won't get that we need uh i'll just go to two slides on to this uh, slide here. Oh, it doesn't want to stay. That's weird. OK, this slide, which um, a number of you will be familiar with, is the um, United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child General Comment 24, which basically says, hey, children with neurodevelopmental delays or neurodevelopmental disorders or disabilities, e.g. autism, fetal alcohol and so forth, should not be in the child justice system at all, even if they've reached the minimum age of criminal responsibility. If they're not automatically excluded, sh such children should be individually assessed. And, you know, we talk about the need to divert, but that's what it actually means is, is that we have to identify them in order to be able to divert them and to understand their behavior in the context of things like dismaturity, suggestibility, confabulation, all things that make our children and young people more vulnerable to perhaps interactions with the justice system and becoming victims, it must be said. So um, we need to obviously implement best practices by accommodating um, once we know what's going on specifically for a child. Um, but as this um, was well, a quote from an article on preparing, best practices begin well before you start getting into trouble and include early screening, assessment, diagnosis, a clear plan of supports, which stretch into education, speech and occupational therapy, family, respite and other assistance. Children are unlikely to either end up in justice uh, because of their neurodisabilities if an infrastructure to address FSD is in place and therefore actually put into practice some of these things that um, my participants highlighted. And ultimately, we must deal with ableism. That's a societal issue, isn't it? Uh, as, as we try to deal with classism, racism, sexism, but we need to deal with ableism. Some great authors, Chapman and Carell uh, from the UK, I think, they talk about neurotypical humility, um, moving away from deficit views of neurodifference and embra embracing a neurodiversity paradigm. And can you imagine justice workers trained in this neurodiversity paradigm? And that would focus on rights and strengths and flourishing capacities, you know, about enabling people to be who they're meant to be and to be in the conversation and actually bringing about change and having a voice to bring about change. Um, so that's about helping people developing their flourishing capacities, the recognition 
um, that those living with neurodisabilities are not doomed to lower well-being. We, we make this assumption, I'm sure, Christine, you'll, you'll see this is totally mirrored with intellectual disabilities. We make this assumption that people with neurodivergent um, uh, conditions are doomed to lower well-being. Why should that be the case? Um, it's people who are neurotypical or being ableist are, are making those assumptions. So we need to recognise they're not doomed to lower well-being. We need to recognise that their thriving and interests can look very different from those you know, who are neurodivergent. So my last slide is basically concluding from just, you know, obviously a few interviews, but um, linking them to the other interviews that I've undertaken, you know, we do need um, urgent training and practice uh, for all professionals working in the youth justice space, and we need to ensure disability rights are upheld to enable that flourishing and participation by young people who are often forgotten about, really. Thank you.